I'm talking about cooperative capital. Um, I drove up here with, or I passengered up here with Anthony and he asked me a question on the way up and he said, um, I don't really understand what capital is for an organisation. The simple answer is it's basically everything at the disposal of an entity for it to be able to carry on its business. For companies, that means it spends the share capital and anything else it makes in order to achieve a financial outcome. Um, when I was at law school, we all had to learn about the concept of what we call maintenance of capital, which is a really boring concept, but it meant that if a company said it had this much in share capital, then a creditor could happily transact with that company and know that their bills would be paid because there was a level of confidence that there was share capital behind it. Uh, of course, what the creditor doesn't really know is that the owners of the business have already spent that share capital anyway, <laughs> and they've just got to work on the basis that the organisation is going to be profitable so that when it comes time to pay that creditor's bill, there's money there to do so. Um, it was often the funniest question at law school when I, was, um, when I was teaching concepts of corporations law and people would say, so what, now that you've got the share capital in, that's kind of free money, what can they do with it? Well, they can spend it. Oh. <laughs> what a concept. Anyway, so really, <laughs> um, how do I go on to the next one? No. Oh. Ah, thank you, thank you. So what I want to say is that um, so cooperative capital is not the same as company capital. Uh, and the way I've tried to approach it is by saying it's actually not equity. Uh, when we talk about equity, we normally define it as the value of shares that a person holds in a company. And the value of a share is determined by the value of the underlying assets. And so each share is then valued by dividing the number of shares, the, the, the assets by the number of shares. In truth, as a legal concept, a share is just a bundle of rights that you buy. Uh, so for a company share, you get um, usually a vote at the AGM. You get possibly a dividend from any profits. Uh, you get a share in the assets of the company if it's wound up. And of course, you've got a right to transfer that share to somebody else. And the value at which you transfer that share is measured against what those underlying assets are. So you don't have to wait till it's wound up, which is probably a good idea anyway, because you can actually capture that underlying value in the secondary sale of the shares. These rights only have a dollar value if the company remains solvent or if it grows. So if the company fails, the value is lost your share value is linked inextricably to the company's fortunes. So when a, buy, when a person buys shares in a company, their rights, including their value, but their rights essentially flow from how the company manages those assets. Cooperative shares are different. A cooperative share is a prerequisite to membership. If you like, it's a kind of entry fee. True, they are a bundle of rights like a share in a company. There's a right to a limited dividend, and that's, that's, it's important you understand that it's a limited dividend. There's a right to repayment if the rules of the cooperative allow it, and we call that concept withdrawable shares, which is quite contrary to the maintenance of capital concept for companies. You have a right to repayment if you decide you don't want to be in the cooperative anymore. And you also have a right to transfer to another member. Voting rights don't attach to your shares. They attach, they attach to your membership. So each member, as they join and agree to the terms in the constitution of the cooperative, has one vote whether they've bought 10 shares or 10,000 shares, their vote is the same. So in that sense, if we're talking about equity, 
we're talking about ownership in the notion of a company share linked to the underlying assets. But for a cooperative, ownership is represented by the ability and the power to control what the cooperative does. So it's the ownership is with the membership and it's represented by that one member, one vote principle. The other thing about cooperative shares is that the share price is fixed. So if they're issued at $1, they'll always be worth $1. So if you do come up to an instance where you do have a, a, a right to repayment on that share, you'll get $1 back unless the cooperative's assets have been devalued in some way, their underlying assets. So if you like, it's a, your, uh, the value of your share is fixed to a degree, unless of course there's a loss of value. Like a company share, it's a risk capital, you could lose the whole amount, um, but there's no upside to it like capital gain for a company share. Who buys them? <laughs> You won't trade them on a, chart, on a share market, you can't, okay? And it's because what you're buying in is membership. They bear no relationship or little or no relationship to the underlying assets. I mean, there are some exceptions to that, but I won't go into that because there's 20 minutes to tell you the broad concepts. <laughs> um, but one thing I will talk about, which is a problem for cooperatives on that notion of a withdrawable share, it does present a risk to the viability of the cooperative. It's controllable through the rules of the cooperative. You can actually make your shares not able to be repurchased by the cooperative, but you will always be at risk that if a member leaves the cooperative, then you're gonna to have to pay back that share capital, even if it's only $1 a share. So that's a challenge, it's a disadvantage advantage for management of a cooperative. It's a challenge, but it's one that they rise to because, in fact, the whole purpose of a cooperative is to keep its members, keep them happy, keep the services that they are originally promised to those members, keep them operating and listen to what it is that the members want. The members then will keep their share capital there because they will stay. And that is one of the key things about managing cooperatives. It's not about chasing that profitable dollar. It's listening to those members who have the control of it and the ability to withdraw their share capital if they wish to leave. It's the withdrawability of shares that have actually made the Accounting Standards Board in Australia and in other countries actually require accountants to record them and present them on the balance sheet as a liability. Cooperatives saw it initially as a liability when those accounting standards changed, but over time, they're learning to convince their financial <laughs> service providers that, in fact, that's not where the value is in the, in the cooperative. It's in the value in the membership's commitment and its actual business operations. I guess it also tells you that accounting standards really are a model not linked to reality. <laughs> 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 we fight accounting standards every day in the co-op sector. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things about cooperatives, so if we, you know, that's their share capital, and you think, oh, why would you buy shares? There's the limited dividend, a fixed price, and so on. But what it is about cooperatives is that they're operating under these seven cooperative principles. So co-ops were formed, you know, at a time, I guess, to help people um, better be able to uh, improve their economic or their social or cultural sort of status, their aspirations. They grew out of a time when individuals were price takers and they had to do something in, in order to help themselves. You know, they were the, the weavers in Rochdale who couldn't buy good food, so they started their own store. So that's where these principles started from. They're designed to bring ownership into the hands of members and the hands of people who actually use the services of the cooperative. I mean, if I have shares in BHP, I don't think I actually use their products directly or have a direct transactional relationship with them, whereas in a cooperative, 
That's key to how they work. They were simple organisations in the beginning, but now their organisational structure under Australian law is so evolved that um, we now have almost a uniform code across Australia. So Queensland is this very day considering <laughs> further um, submissions about passing the cooperative's national law in their, their committee stage. Uh, one of the things about them is that they now have all of the same corporate powers as a company. They can operate any kind of business in a, under Australian law. Their differences are internal and they're evinced by these seven cooperative principles. The thing about these principles are they're very attractive, you know, to people who want to create a new economy or a new way of uh, manufacturing, a new way of supporting communities. Wow, these sound, sound really fantastic. And, you know, they were invented back in 1840, way ahead of B Corporation certification. You know, B Corps, if you like, are followers. <laughs> Cooperatives had these principles in the beginning. But in the context of what I want to talk about today, I really just want to think about one of these principles, which is the third one there called member economic participation. And one of the reasons why, so the principles are like our three word slogans that our politicians tell us all of the time, but underneath each of those principles, there is text. And the one for member economic participation is particularly interesting. So members contribute equity. I've done the, you know, the, the bold type, right? What the bit I want to draw your attention to, of course, is that part of that capital that they contribute becomes the common property of the cooperative. Members use limited, receive limited compensation. That's the dividends on their capital. But they then allocate their surpluses or profits for any of the following purposes, being developing or growing their cooperative, but by setting up reserves, part of which would be indivisible. So the notion of your share capital repayable at the same fixed price is that a cooperative over time develops two types of capital. It's got its share capital, which is at a fixed level, or it grows as you grow more members, obviously, but it also develops this core capital as well, which sits there in the cooperative. Member benefits continue to flow all of the time because members are trading with the business all of the time and building up that transactional part of their operations. And what they're finding that in working with that cooperative, just as Andrew was saying, it actually brings them into part of the business of the cooperative. They are benefiting by it from transacting with the cooperative because the services that they're getting from it are either cheaper or because they're getting better goods and services by sharing the costs of acquiring them. But the, capitals, the capital that is built up over time sits there not just for these current members but for future generations of members. They're sustainable over the long term and that ownership stays with the cooperative as the separate legal entity. If you think about what used to happen in the 80s with all of those corporate raiders, so a, a company would build up a great number of assets, someone would come along, <laughs> buy it and sell all of those assets and just take that away. That's the nature of how the, the speculative market works with, with companies, one minute. Oh, I haven't got very far, have I? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, so you'll see I really like cooperatives, but one of the things I'm talking about it is that the capital has an enduring equality about it, and that's what got a lot of cooperatives through that global financial crisis. I've got some other slides which I have to say, hang on. Here, this is the one I really I have to thank Janelle Orsi for this. So investing in company shares, this is my message. It's a bit like blowing bubbles. You're putting it into an organisation, uh, they're spending your share capital. You may get a, a return on your capital. You may get uh, a dividend, but you don't have much control because you've got one vote per share. 
and thousands of others have got the same <laughs> numbers of votes per share. But the other key thing about it is that they don't have a purpose. Companies are, if you like, agnostic about what it is that they do. They're doing things merely to make profit. The comparison is a cooperative because they are social enterprises. That notion of having that cooperative capital sitting there as an enduring part of their capital makeup is what is, I guess, the whole purpose of why I was attracted to come here. It's that commonwealth that sits within the community of members who own by controlling that cooperative. Uh, I was going to talk about cooperative capital units as means of financing them. Oh, Andrew says yes. Because yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> one of the problems with uh, cooperatives always has been their access to external capital. Traditionally, they've relied on the capital of members, either by buying shares in the cooperative, trading with them, or even lending money to the cooperative. Under the cooperative's national law, I might just go back a bit, uh, that, that bottom square that says cooperative capital units, there's a new kind of flexible, flexible uh, financial instrument that a cooperative can issue in order to raise funds. So cooperatives, in one sense, are regulated a little bit like public companies. They can issue financial instruments to the public or to their members or both. The cooperative capital unit is their new way, uh, once Queensland joins, <laughs> that nationally they'll be able to issue these instruments and raise funds provided they look after that balance of member control within the cooperative. So then we come to what is my last one, which is that talking about the sorts of things that uh, cooperatives need to consider in terms of how much external capital they bring into their cooperative. We all sort of think about the, the failure of something like Murray Goulburn, which in, was in fact a company, not a cooperative. Okay. Part of the problem with that was that the, that balance between the member control, being the farmer members, and the external investors hadn't been properly looked at at the time that that financial um, undertaking uh, began. The Cooperative's national law includes regulatory processes to help members manage that, that balance. But I guess the last thing I really want to say is that for cooperatives, the challenge always has been that they're quiet organisations. They don't yell and scream and say the regulatory system doesn't suit us. Um, and it's something that, in terms of any of these big ideas about how we fashion a new economy, how we deal with inappropriate models, is that it's really important for organisations and the people who want to be in them that they keep an eye on these, I guess, tiny or minute issues. The regulatory system is there it needs to actually be responsive and facilitative to the things that we want it to do. So if we want cooperatives to work, we have to really concentrate on how it is that the regulatory system does help that cooperative model and that is able to do the things that we want them to do, including talking to the Australian Accounting Standards Board. Okay, thank you very much.